very happy today to introduce uh, Dr. Richard Teague as our colloquium speaker. Um, Rich did his undergraduate degree at the University of Edinburgh uh, and then moved to Heidelberg for his PhD in the Max Planck School program at the MPIA. Um, after he got his PhD, and he did a two-year postdoctoral stint at the University of Michigan, and then he joined the CFA uh, a little more than two years ago as a submillimeter sub array fellow. Uh, next year, he'll start as an assistant professor in the Earth and Planetary Science Department at MIT. So Rich is an expert in molecular spectroscopy of protoplanetary disks, um, and in particular, exploiting the, the sort of very high spectral resolution available from radio interferometer measurements to learn particularly about kinematics. Um, among other things, he's made some very important contributions to our understanding of turbulence and angular momentum transport in these disks. And he's been a real leader in the development of new techniques that are now helping to identify and characterize very subtle non-Keplerian perturbations to the disk dynamics that we expect to see during the epoch of planet formation. So he'll tell us about that uh, work today in his talk entitled, Witnessing the Assembly of Planetary Systems. So Rich, uh, welcome, please uh, take it away. Thank you very much for the introduction, Sean, and hello everyone. It's my real pleasure to be here today and share with you what I've been really worked on for the last couple of years and hopefully give a flavor of what's gonna come in the next couple of them. So before I get going on the science, I really want to highlight a couple of collaborators that I've been working with that have been really instrumental in what I'm going to show you. Um, so first of all, I really want to say a big thank you to Jay Han Bay, who is a new faculty at the University of Florida. And it's really through his uh, theoretical insights, it's really helped us interpret what we've been seeing in these protoplanetary disks and making sense of these very bizarre observations that we've been seeing. I also want to point out two fantastic undergraduate students I've had the pleasure to work with, Alessandra Cantor, who was a Harvard undergraduate here and is now at Imperial, and Howard Chan Yu, who was at Beijing Normal University, and he's now at Oxford. And they've both really done some fantastic stuff, and I hope to share some of that work with you later today. I also want to highlight Charles Law, who is a graduate student here, and Charles has really been incredibly helpful at working through a lot of the problems and the codes we've been developing particularly when we've been looking at disentangling the 3D structure of protoplanetary disks. So really, there's a big thank you to everyone involved, but in particular, these four people. So I want to take a step back really to motivate why we're looking at these protoplanetary disks. And this is a figure that I'm sure everyone here has seen many times before. I think it really underpins a lot of what we're doing here. This was our knowledge of planetary systems 30 years ago. So we have planetary mass on the y-axis and their orbital distance from the star along the x-axis. And looking at our own solar system, we have this very particular architecture where we had four rocky terrestrial planets close to the sun, and then we had four gas giants slightly further away. And with this architecture in mind, we were able to come up with many different formation scenarios that were able to reproduce the planets that we knew of then. However, with the first detection of an extrasolar planet, a planet around a star other than ours, our view of what a planetary system could be rapidly changed. And this catalyzed 30 years of intense research of designing and building new instrumentation, developing new analysis techniques, and spending simply thousands of person hours pouring over data to try and tease out the subtle signs of planets in the data that we're looking at. And the culmination of all this work is this wonderful population of exoplanets that we've seen. And I'm plotting all of the ones here as gray dots. And you can see really there's a stunning diversity of planets that we're finding. And this figure is really a springboard for a tremendous amount of science trying to explain the various populations and subpopulations that we're seeing. But for me, I think the real takeaway from this figure is simply the scales that we're seeing on the two axes. And both the planetary mass and in the orbital radius of these planets, we're seeing variations of over seven orders of magnitude. And this is a really an astonishing variety in planetary properties. And this really begs the question of whether we understand planet formation at all. Do we really expect all these planets to be forming from the same mechanism? Are the ones very close to the star forming the same as the ones far away and migrating? Or are they using different mechanisms? 
if they're using different mechanisms or forming in different regions, are they tracing the same reservoirs of material? Do we expect their cores and their atmospheres to be made up of the same molecules? And what does all this say about our own solar system? We know it's very hard to find solar system analogs because of sensitivity issues. But if we're using this broad population of exoplanets to understand how we form, is that really going to be a reliable connection? Or are we going to have to think a bit harder about how to do that? So many people are approaching these questions in very different ways. But the way I've been doing it, along with many other people at the CFA, is to go to the planet formation environment itself, the protoplanetary disk. If we can study these regions, we can study the planet formation in action. This is one of my favorite images of a protoplanetary disk. This is IM loop taken with the sphere instrument on the BLT. So this is tracing infrared photons that have been emitted by the central star and have been scattered off the small submicron grains in the atmosphere of this disk. This gives a really wonderful view of the disk and really highlights how this is a three-dimensional structure. See, it's got a large vertical extent. You have this convex flared in a region, and you also have this very dark plane along the midplane of it, where the light from the star just cannot penetrate down. And over the last 10 years, we've really seen a tremendous increase in the structures that we're tracing with these sorts of techniques, thanks to advances in adaptive optics technology. So we've seen everything from these very quiet looking disks I just showed, to these really stunning images where we see spirals and gaps and rings and really turbulent looking environments. And this is really exciting because it's showing that the places where we think planets should be forming do indeed look to be incredibly dynamic and active. However, the problem here is that we're only scratching the surface, both figuratively and literally. These protoplanetary disks, by definition, will grow grains. So what we're looking at here is the small submicron particles. But as these grains grow bigger, they're going to slowly dissipate out in the atmosphere and drop down to the midplane of the disk, much like snowflakes fall from a cloud when they grow too big. It's these larger grains that fall along the midplane of the disk that will eventually build up into the planets that we're looking for. So we really don't want to be tracing the surface of these disks. We want to be tracing the midplanes. And the way that we do this is by moving to longer wavelengths. As a rule of thumb, the grains that we're looking at with thermal emission are on the order of the size of the wavelength that we're using. So by moving to seven millimeter and millimeter observations, we're going to be tracing those millimeter sized particles that we know are at the midplane of the disk. So now looking at IM loop again, we can look at this disk in the millimeter and we see a very different picture. Most strikingly, you can see that this is now a very thin 2D looking disk. And that's because those grains have all sedimented down to this midplane. But you also see there's a stunning amount of substructure here. We've got gaps and rings and even two spirals in the inner region. And again, this is really exciting because these are the regions where we expect planets to be forming. And indeed, we're seeing the hallmarks of those planet disk interactions. What's also reassuring is that these disks, even though they look relatively quiet on the surface, deeper down, it really looks like there's a lot going on. So perhaps if we go out to a large number of sources, we're going to see this as a very common occurrence. This was exactly the motivation for the D-sharp large survey that was led by Sean Andrews here. And they set out to understand how ubiquitous these sort of features are. And as you can see from this wonderful gallery, the answer was they seem pretty common. No matter what disk they looked at, it appeared that when you had the spatial resolution, you're going to resolve some level of substructure. This is primarily gaps and rings, but there were certain sources that also showed azimuthal structure, such as spirals. So this is really, really fantastic. We're now in a position where every single disk we look at with ALMA and the, in the near infrared with adaptive optics instruments, we're seeing the hallmarks of planet disk interactions. And this has been an absolute treasure trove for the theoreticians that are trying to explain the structures that we're seeing. And we've got increasingly efficient at producing this wild and wonderful structures. As an example, I have this movie from Jayhan Bay. So he starts off with a smooth disk, just gas in this system. And in it, he rapidly grows the Jupiter mass planet and looks at how that influences the disk. The planet is going to shock the gas around it, driving these large spiral arms. These spiral arms will in turn torque the gas and open up a large gap around the planet, as you can see by this dark plane here. Under certain conditions, the inner arm of this arising from the planet is actually strong enough to excite its own set of rings further in. So you get this nested ring pattern 
So on top of the spirals, the gaps and the multiple rings, we're also seeing these azimuthal structures as gas is trapped in what we call horseshoe orbits on the opposite side of the disk. And all this is coming from just a single planet. So this makes it very hard to look at these disks where we're seeing all the twinkle structure and infer how many planets would need to be there. I think a really nice example of how this is a very tricky problem is when we compare two disks. HL Tau on the left, which was the first disk that we detected gaps and rings in, and AS209 on the right. AS209 was observed as part of the D-sharp survey and it's really striking with these very two narrow rings. Now, two different groups set about trying to model these systems, and they were able to match the emission structure really quite well. The interesting thing was that with HL Tau, the authors managed to use many planets to create many gaps. I think in this instance, they required three different planets to create all the structures that we're seeing. Conversely, with AS209, the authors were able to reproduce all this structure with just a single planet. And we needed to tweak the physical structure a little bit to get it, but it really shows the degeneracy in just looking for planets based on the gaps and rings that they're driving in the disks. So to really go beyond this, what we want to do is detect these point sources. We want to be able to detect certain planetary disks around these objects. However, this is a really challenging thing to do. These certain planetary disks are really, really small and incredibly faint. However, recently we've been able to make the first detection, the robust detection of a certain planetary disk around PGS-70C. So this was work that was led by Miriam Benesky, and it was really a huge undertaking trying to combine all these different data sets and really getting to grips with how you make an image with these inframetric data sets that really provides a realistic picture of what's going on in the cavities in these sort of sources. So this is a really promising avenue that we can detect planets based on certain planetary disks but this is an incredibly expensive way to do it. You need the proposal killing combination of extremely high resolution and extreme sensitivity to be able to do this. So it's gonna take quite a while until we're able to roll this out on a multiple object survey. You'll also see if you're familiar with PDS-70 that there's something strange about this image. We know this disk should be hosting two planets, B and C, and yet we've only able to detect one of these planets in certain planetary material. So this is really questioning, again, our understanding of certain planetary disks. Would we really expect every planet in the disk to have them or not? This is really a question that's going to have to wait until we can start opening up these large surveys to search for these sort of things. Nonetheless, we can use these gaps and rings in the substructure that we're seeing in all the disks to understand what sort of planetary population we'd expect to find. And so I filled in this figure from the start with these orange stars representing the sort of planets we would need to broadly explain the structures that we're seeing. And you can see that we're really populating a separate region in this parameter space. We're looking at the more massive planets that are very widely separated from their own star, ones with periods that are just too long to do any sort of uh, transit uh, methods or radial velocities. More interestingly for me, at least though, is the other region of parameter space that we trace with these planets. And this is in terms of their age. All these planets are going to be around a mega year old, one million years. They're going to be extremely young. They're still embedded in their protoplanetary disk. And it's going to be these sources that are going to provide us the most direct way to test our planet formation models. If we can catch planet formation in gaps, then this is how we're going to differentiate between different mechanisms. So how do we do a bit better than just looking at the continual mission? Well, the way that I've been approaching this problem is to look at the dynamical structure of these disks. We know they're about 99% mass, 99% uh, gas by their mass. And so we know the planets are also going to be causing very large disturbances in this. And those are things that we can be searching for. This is, we've known the planets are going to cause these sort of perturbations for as long as we've been running numerical simulations of planet disk interactions. On the left, I'm showing some very early work from Billy Clay, who was running 2D simulations of a planet within a disk. And you can see that the planet has opened up this large gap, as you see before, by shocking these spirals. These little arrows are showing you the gas motions. And you can see that around the planets, you're getting some rotation. So this is the circum planetary disk. And you can see that along the spirals, you're ejecting material away. This is how it's opening up the gap. On the right-hand side, this is a, an advancement of this uh, simulation where they've moved to three dimensions. And you can now look at the vertical structure of the velocities. 
As we saw in the 2D simulation, the planet is pushing material away from it along the midplane. So the only way it can actually accrete material is by having gas collapse in from above it down onto it. And that's what we're seeing in this right-hand figure here. These original flows are gas from the edges of the gap flowing down and funneling onto the planet's circumplanetary disk system. So over the last couple of years, there's been a few of us trying to understand which of these features we are likely to be able to detect with the instruments that we have. And so this is just an example, uh, taking a numerical simulation of planet disk interactions to understand how the planets are going to perturb the rotational velocity in these disks. On the left, I'm showing the surface density, so this is the gas. And you can see that there is some low-level gaps being carved open by these planets, and you can probably see the spiral arms emanating from the planets. However, when you move to the changes in the rotation velocity, we see very strong signatures that should be absolutely screaming in the data. You can see that around the planets, the spirals are traced very well by these large changes in the rotation velocity. And more importantly, there's a change in the sign of the velocity deviation around the planet. The inner arm is moving differently to the outer arm. And so this change in sign in the residuals is going to be a very powerful way for us to try and find where these planets are located. Not only do we have a very strong signature that's roughly 5% of the background deviation, but we've got a clear signal for where the planet should be on that spiral arm. So the way that we want to do this is to look at our data, which is in three dimensions. And the sort of data that we get from ALMA um, is similar to what you'd get from any sort of IFU instrument, where you have two spatial axes and one spectral axis. In this 3D data cube, we're essentially projecting the 3D structure and the 3D velocity structure all into this 3D volume. So there's a lot of degeneracies going on. But because we know the disk is going to be dominated by this Keplerian mutation, we already have a strong prior of what the emission morphology should look like in this 3D space. So on the left, I'm showing an example from some of the maps data, which I'll talk a bit about later, showing the emission from a disk around HD163296. And this wonderful butterfly pattern is exactly the structure that we would expect from a Keplerian rotating source. You have one blue side emission with uh, the disk coming towards you, and then the red shifted side as the disk moves away from you. So knowing that we have this connection of how emission moves in this 3D volume to how its velocity structure varies, we can start to search for subtle changes in the emission morphology and relate that to subtle changes in the velocity morphology. And so this was some work that was done recently by Christoph Hunt, who was able to detect a very localized velocity perturbation in these sort of data sets. So here I've just taken a single channel map. So that's essentially a mission at a very specific frequency. And he was able to identify this thunderbolt pattern in one of the arms of the Keplerian pattern that I was showing you earlier. Here you can see it quite strongly. And then if you look at the arms in other regions of the disk, you have a very smooth profile. And so Christoph was able to um, associate this sort of localized kink or this thunderbolt pattern with a localized velocity perturbation, which he argued was due to a planet. And you can probably see this more clearly when you look at these two panels, which is comparing emission from different sides of the disk. And around the planet is where you see this very strong feature but when the emission is tracing the other side of the disk, when you move to different frequencies, you can see that you have these very smooth arms. So we really need a very localized perturbation in velocity to explain what we're seeing. Well, this wasn't really convincing enough for many people to believe that there's a planet there, but this didn't deter Christoph, and he was set about trying to find similar features in other sources. And he found another one in the disk around HD 97048. And here it's in the third panel where it's strongest, but it's still a very subtle deviation. But the difference between this source and the last one I showed you is that this deviation lands exactly on top of a gap in the continuum mission. You can't see it very well directly from the images, but I've overplotted these dashed lines to highlight where that gap was. And so Christoph was able to show through numerical modeling that a Jupiter mass planet was the best explanation for how you'd both open a gap in the dust continuum by carving open this gap and creating a very localized velocity perturbation. And it was this detection that was actually the first planet that we detected by disk kinematics, and it's now in the NASA's exoplanet database as such. <laughs> 
while this is a really promising method, I think you'll agree that going through these channel maps and trying to discern what wiggles are real and what are going to be um, just noise is not really going to be a robust way of finding planets and not one that we can really roll out to a large survey. So I've been working on different techniques to try and do this in a more robust way in a more quantitative manner. And to demonstrate this, I want to move to DW Hydra, which is a really well-studied source. It's the closest disk to Earth. And so because of this, it just has a tremendous amount of observations on it. And we really have a good idea of what we of the physical structure here. And we've known for a long time that this disk really should be hosting embedded planets. We've seen gaps and rings both in the submicron grains traced with sphere over here on the left. You can see these ring-like structures. And we see rings in the millimeter continuum emission shown over here, these wonderfully sharp gaps. And so in both these populations of rings, one traced in the surface and one traced in the midplane, we're seeing these hallmarks of planet open gaps. We've also seen the same evidence for gaps in the system when we look at molecular emission as well. So on the left here, we're able to use the CS molecule, carbon monosulfide, to trace what the gas is doing in the outer disk. And we were able to show that there was a very subtle dropping, dimming of the intensity at the same location, which we could show was most likely due to a deficit of gas. So although we had this system with very large rings in it, where we knew there was a, a deficit of gas and dust, any attempt to try and detect planets in these gaps really failed. We were hitting very uh, tight limits on what we could do, but we just couldn't really penetrate the surface. So what we decided to do instead was to look at the velocity structure of this system and see whether we could tease anything out from there. So on the left, I'm showing you the map of the projected line of sight velocity that we see. And we're able to map this out at a spatial resolution of around 10 AU with our one hour. So we're really managing to tease out very tiny details. And what we're seeing here is the projection of all three components along our line of sight. We have the rotational velocity, which is going to be dominated by the Keplerian rotation. And then any additional radial or vertical motion, so they're going to be present because of either dynamical um, instabilities within the disk or because of planet disk interactions. And so because we know this velocity field is going to be dominated by the Keplerian rotation, we can provide a model for that and subtract that away to try and see what we see in the residuals. And so by doing that, we're left with this map which has a tremendous amount of structure in it. So for those that haven't spent a long time looking at these maps, this can look very noisy. So I just want to guide you through some of the features we're seeing. First of all, I want to highlight the spatial resolution of this data set, which is shown by the ellipse down here. So if we're really looking at a truly noisy image, what we'll be seeing is specs and only correlations on the order of the beam size. The fact that we're seeing very coherent structures over very large regions of the disk is showing us that what we're tracing is real variations in the velocity field and not simply because of noise. There's two main features that we saw in this uh, data set. Firstly, you have these three concentric arcs on the right-hand side of the disk, this red, blue, red feature. And what we found that these were, were tracing exactly the edge of this gap that I showed in the near infrared scattered light. And so what we're seeing here is the modulation of the rotation speed of the gas due to the pressure gradients at the edge of the gap. On the inner edge of the gap, you have a strongly negative pressure gradient, and on the outer edge, you have a strongly positive gradient. And this is going to change the rotation speed, and that's why we get these very strong arcs. So we're able to confirm that indeed what we're seeing was a large gap in the gas surface density. Further round, we also see this very strong arc, this uh, positive residual that we see. And this arc lands exactly in the center of this gap at around 90 AU. And we see that it actually has some radial dependence. It's a very tightly wound spiral. Given the geometry of the system, this positive residual means that we're tracing gas moving from the atmosphere down towards the midpoint. So we've been able to detect a gap where localized within that gap, we're seeing material rushing from the atmosphere to the midplane of the disk. And this is exactly the prediction that we've been making from these numerical simulations where the planet is opening up a gap by pushing material away down in the midplane, and the atmosphere is having to collapse down to compensate. So this was a really exciting finding because it showed that despite all these null results with direct imaging searches, looking at the dynamics is probably a way that we can do this. And so we set out to get more observations to try and confirm that what we're seeing was indeed 
this large vertical motion. And we are rewarded a lot more time with Alma to do this. And the new data set I'm showing in the central uh, panel here is tracing a slightly different transition of CO. So we're tracing slightly deeper in the disk. And you can see that again, we recover really wonderfully this arc-like feature and the edges of the gap. And what's particularly interesting about this data set is that now that we know we're trying to look for dynamical perturbations, um, we can design the observations in a way that reduces these best maps. So now we have this sort of data that's appropriate for that sort of study, you can start to see that the spiral extends much further than we had previously anticipated. And so this combination of looking at the dynamical structure of the disk in concept with looking at the secular perturbations in the dust means that we're going to have a really good handle of where, and where these planets are. And indeed, by modeling the magnitude of the perturbations, we can get a very strong constraint on their mass. And it's not just TW Hydra where we've been able to do this. We're starting to see in a whole host of systems that we're seeing lots of structure. And these are two examples, again, from the map survey, which I'll touch upon in a little bit, where we've been able to find these very long arcs of velocity residuals that are indicative of embedded planets. And so we're really hopeful that if we roll this out to a lot of sources, we're going to start to see a tremendous amount of substructure and fine planets that we weren't able to see before in the dust. But moving to the gas from the dust also has the, the added advantage that we're tracing a much larger area. Because the dust feels the headwind drag from the gas, large particles are going to move very rapidly into the inner regions of the disk. This means that the, molecular, the millimeter continuum that we're tracing, such as those uh, structures that we saw with the D-sharp survey, are only tracing the inner third of the disk. Whereas if we look at the gas, then we have an area 10 times the size that we're able to search for planets. So if we compare the size of the gas disk for these two disks to their continuum images, you can see that we're really able to extend the search for planets into much larger uh, radii that we just couldn't do through the dust. And this has a really powerful advantage because now if we want to go hunting for it with direct imaging um, methods, looking in the very edges of the disk where the dust uh, capacity is minimized, this is going to help a lot. And so we've got a proposal through with James Webb to do exactly this. And there's a couple of other projects through where we've been leveraging the kinematic features that we detect with ALMA to guide us where we should be finding these planets in the outer regions of the disk where we simply wouldn't have the sensitivity to if we were limited to just looking at the continuum. So with these sort of techniques to hand, we're able to localize velocity perturbations and compare that to the structures that we see in the dust. We can start to change some of these exoplanet candidates that I marked with small oranges into exoplanet detections. And you can see that we're really starting to fill out this region of parameter space. But at the moment, this is a slow process. This is something that we've only really developed over the last couple of years, and so we don't really have the right dates to do that. However, we've been fortunate enough in the last couple of months to be awarded a large program to do exactly this. So I'll be leading the Exo Alma large program along with Miriam Benesty, Stefano Puccini, Mizuto Fukugawa, and Christoph Punt, where we're going to survey 15 sources to really detail the kinematic structure of these disks to an unprecedented detail. We think with these sort of observations, we're going to be sensitive to planetary masses down to a Saturn mass, and we're really going to provide some of the best um, and most comprehensive searches for planets in protoplanetary disks to gain it. So this is really a bright future for what we're doing. We've now got techniques where we think we're able to detect those planets that are forming within the disks. So with that to hand, it's worth going back to the questions that I posed at the start to think about how we can start to answer them now that we know where the planets are within the disk. Now that we know the planets, we can now ask what mechanisms they're forming from. We can ask what materials they're accreting, and we can start to understand whether there's, uh, the planetary systems that we're detecting might look like anything like a young solar system. So for the next 20 minutes or so, I just want to go through how we're tackling these questions also with ALMA and how we're building up this full picture of how and when planet formation occurs. So I think one of the major step forwards that we've made in the last couple of years is that with ALMA, we've achieved a spatial resolution that allows us to really discern the 3D structure of these protoplanetary disks. Previously, we thought they were very thin and flat, and that's because we simply couldn't trace the vertical structure with the line emission. 
On the left, I'm showing an example of how we've been able to extract the emission surface from PDS-70. This was the system I showed earlier where we detected one of the certain pantry disks. And what's interesting here is that in addition to the convex sort of flared surface that I showed before with the near infrared images, what's going on in this system is that the two planets, PDS-70, B and C, have managed to carve out a cavity in the inner regions. And we're actually able to see that there's no gas within its inner regions, so we're left with a more donut to torus shaped disk. And by being able to map out these sort of structures, these are going to give us a really strong constraint on how the planets are interacting with their disk. But not only do we want to look at how the planets interact with the disk, we want to understand what the disk conditions are themselves. And so one way that we can do this is to look at how the emission surface of the gas compares to the emission surface traced by the dust. So these two figures are made from a, by Charles Snow for his maps paper, where he was tracing the emission surface through 12 CO and 13 CO. And that's shown by these black lines. And he was able to compare them with the scattering surface measured by near infrared observations. And so this is a very early line of questioning. But now that we're able to access these sort of surfaces, this is going to start telling us about how the gas and the dust are coupled in the vertical direction. And we can hopefully try and learn something about the vertical density profiles within these disks. We're no longer limited to just understanding how the gas varies as a function of radius, but also as a function of height. And now what's also particularly interesting is that when we use optically thick emission to do these emission surface extractions, is that their intensity is going to be telling us something about the temperature of the gas too. So not only can we fill out the surface that they're coming from, but we can start to fill in these 2D temperature structures of these disks. And this is a really huge step forward in underpinning the simulations that we've been running. So you can see here, you have an incredibly hot atmosphere with the gas temperatures decreasing as you go to the mid plane. And this is because these disks are externally irradiated by their central star. And as you move closer to the mid plane, they become more and more shielded until they get cooler and cooler. And this is a really nice direct confirmation of all those theoretical models that we've been using over the last several decades. A real example of how we're using these new 2D density and temperature structures to uh, aid our understanding of the planet formation process comes about when we think about how planets generate spirals within the disks. So I want to go back to this TW Hydra example that I showed you earlier, and this very tightly wound arc that we found. What was particularly puzzling about this arc was simply how tightly wound it was. Usually we'd use a linear theory for Lindblad spirals, but we weren't able to find any sort of disk parameters that allowed us to match the structure that we saw, which I've traced here in the solid line, with any of the analytical models. The best fitting model here is shown by the dash line, and you can see that this is a really poor fit to the data. And it wasn't just this disk where we've seen this issue. In MWC 480, we've been able to trace spirals in the gas temperature, which you can see with this polar plot here. The spirals are pretty hard to see with this projection, but if you unravel it and plot it as a polar plot, you can see these spirals manifest as these straight lines. But again, these spirals are much too tightly wound to be explained by these Lindblad resonances. We simply didn't know what was causing something that could be so tightly wound. So this was work that was led by Jay Han Bay, and he went back to the drawing board and considered what would happen when you start using these more realistic temperature structures that we're detecting in the disks when you have planet disk interactions. And he was able to find that if you have a very strong vertical temperature gradient, then the planet is able to excite a second family of resonances, namely the buoyancy resonances, which will excite spirals very high up in the atmosphere of the disk. And so not only are these spirals much higher up, exactly where we're tracing with the molecular emission, they're also much more tightly wound than the Lindblad spirals, which we we'll be tracing in the mid -term. And so these three panels are just showing examples from his numerical simulations, where we're changing the mass of the planet, driving the perturbations. And you can see that in all cases, we have this wonderful spiral that's incredibly tightly wound. And this is really due to the fact that we have this vertical temperature structure that we're now able to constrain directly from the observations. Not only are we able to do this, but the combination of tracing buoyancy resonances in the atmosphere of the disk and trying to search these Lindblad resonances further down closer to the planet 
is going to give us a really good constraint in the planetary mass if we understand how these spirals change as a function of height within the disk. So now we've got an idea of where the planets are, and we've got techniques that are able to map out the temperature and density of the formation environment. What we want to understand now is what molecules are around. What is the composition of the gas that these planets will be accreting to form their atmospheres? So this question of chemical diversity or molecular diversity was the question, well, one of the main science drivers of the Max Large program, which was led by Karen Oberg here, where they set out to survey five sources in a whole variety of molecular species to understand whether there's any disk-to-disk -disk diversity, or indeed within a disk, how those molecules vary as a function of radius. And this panel of 12 different molecular species on the right highlights the findings, I think, very neatly. Despite being able to trace loads of different molecules that trace different properties of the disk, such as the CO isotope logs that are going to be tracing your gas densities, you've got your simple hydrocarbons that are going to be incredibly sensitive to the local carbon to oxygen ratios, and you've also got the simple complex species, which are going to be the precursors to these more complex molecules that we're detecting in meteorites. And so we've seen a whole range of these in these five sources, and every disk is looking different. And even within the same disk, you can see that there's a huge diversity in the structures that we're seeing. These CO isotope logs are basically emitting everywhere, whereas these smaller hydrocarbons are really tracing the ring structure that we're seeing in the continuum emission. So hidden within all these molecules, there's a tremendous amount of information, not only about the astrochemistry and the chemical processes, but also about the underlying physical structure, how hot, how dense the gas is, how highly ionized it all is. There's a huge amount of information there that's going to take a little while to unravel, but there's already been a huge head start with last week the MAPS papers being published, and there's 20 or so papers that came out of that trying to analyze and make sense of all the data that we had here. So there's a lot of people already at the CFA that work a lot in chemistry, so I don't want to spend too much time on that. But I really want to talk a bit about what I've been doing in trying to find the molecules or making it a bit easier to detect the weak ones. As I said, the observations that we're getting are these 3D data sets, these data cubes where you have two position and one velocity axis. And so if we have a good idea of how that structure or how the emission should look within that volume, and we have a good idea of the velocity structure of the disk, we can then collapse that 3D data to really tease out weak detections and collapse it in a way that really boosts our sensitivity. And so there's been a few separate techniques that have all been leveraging this idea that have allowed us to really make much more, uh, many more detections of more complex species that we simply didn't have the sensitivity to do before. And so on the top, I'm showing a detection of CH2CN that was led by Alessandro Cantor, this fantastic undergraduate that I was working with um, in TW Hydra. And on the bottom, I'm showing a whole gallery of the complex species that we found in the map survey, where we've leveraged these um, velocity techniques to really boost the signal that we're seeing. And so combining really the wonderful sensitivity of ALMA with these techniques to push that even further, we're building this huge inventory of the gas that's available in these disks for these plants to accrete. It's not just the molecular complexity that we can start to look at with disks. We can also try and understand the magnetic fields within these disks. We know when we look at meteoritic records that there's a tremendous amount of magnetic fields that are buried over the evolution of the solar system. And so the way that we typically look for magnetic fields in these protoplanetary disks is by looking for polarized continuum emission. And that's what I'm showing here is some observations that we have at CW Hydra, where we've traced the polarized continuum emission at two different wavelengths, and we reveal this wonderful azimuthal pattern. This is all well and good, but in the meantime, people have got to work and found that we can really explain the polarization morphologies that we see without the need of magnetic fields at all. There are different ways, such as self-scattering or the alignment, the mechanical alignment of brains, that can produce these polarization morphologies without any magnetic fields at all. So it turns out we can't use continuum polarization to understand the magnetic fields, but instead we need to move to polarization of molecular lines. 
So that's what I've been working on a little bit over the last year or so, is trying to adapt these techniques that we've been using to detect very weak molecular emission, and I'll use it to detect very weak polarized molecular emission. And so this is essentially the result of that work where we've managed to tease out incredibly low levels of polarization in the disk of TW hydra in the line wings. So on the top, I'm showing you the unpolarized emission. So this is 12 CO. And this is the real data. We achieve a signal to noise ratio in the thousands. It's really just astounding the sensitivity of these observations. And even though these observations are so deep, we really had to squeeze and squeeze the data to really tease out these incredibly small polarization signals in there. And so although this is a tough thing to do, it shows that we can start to trace the magnetic fields in these systems. And we can start to understand how the magnetic field structure may have varied throughout the formation of the planets. So this is really great. It now shows that we can really take an inventory of the materials available to build these planets. And we know where the planets are and how they should be accreting. But really, what reservoirs will they be increasing their atmospheres from? So this is something that many people have been working on for a while, and in particular, this idea of the C to O ratio. Essentially, the C to O ratio is a very useful diagnostic of where a planet may have formed. And this is because the three main carriers of carbon and oxygen in the protoplanetary disk, which are water, carbon dioxide, and carbon monoxide, all freeze out at different temperatures. So as you move radially away from the star and the gas gets cooler and cooler, these molecules are going to freeze out at different locations. And this means at different locations in the disk, you're going to have different ratios of C to O in the gas in the solid phase. And so if we're able to go to an exoplanet, measure the composition of the carbon and oxygen in the atmosphere, we can try and use that to understand where the planet may have formed. And so this is what I'm trying to show on this right panel here, where Laura Preiberg was able to compare different models of varying carbon to oxygen ratios to match their data. And they're able to show in this particular instance that a low carbon to oxygen ratio fitted the data more than a high carbon to oxygen ratio. However, a lot of the work done here has really looked at what the mid-plane composition of the C to O ratio is. But as I showed earlier in the talk, we see that a lot of material is delivered to these planets through some original flows. The planet is actually clustering material away from it along the mid-plane and the gas is flowing in from the top. So if we have this very large temperature gradient where we have a very warm, highly ionized surface, we're going to be tracing a very chemically complex atmosphere that's going to be delivered down to these planets. And so if we want to understand how much of this reservoir that we're seeing in the atmosphere is delivered to these planets, we need to try and measure how strong these meridional flows are. So I've already shown that we have tentative evidence for these sort of flows in TW Hydra. I argued that because we're seeing a positive velocity residual and the projection of the disk on the sky means that we're tracing material movement from the atmosphere to the mid plane, suggests that what we're seeing here is exactly original flows. But we can do this a bit better or more accurately when we consider a disk that is rather slightly inclined along the line of sight. And that's what we did for HD 163296. So again, this is a very bright disk, and so that's why we're able to do it here. And we're able to try and understand the 3D structure of the source. So on the left, I'm plotting the rotation map, this line of sight velocity that we're seeing. And you can see that the dipole morphology has a slight bend in it. And that bend comes about from the 3D structure that we're resolving. On the right-hand side, I'm showing the emission surface that we're able to extract this 3D structure. And in the middle, I've overlaid them to try and highlight how this 3D structure produces this bend in the dipole and morphology that we're seeing. So now that we have a good idea of what the 3D structure is, we have an understanding of how the velocities are going to be projected along our line of sight. And we can use this to deproject those line of sight velocities into their three components, the radial, the rotational, and the vertical. And that's what we're able to do within this disk. And so with these uh, arrows I'm showing you here, the vertical velocity structure in the atmosphere, the disk around HD163296 as traced by CO molecular emission. And this was a really, really exciting finding because we saw not only that we could trace the velocity structure in the atmosphere, but we saw a tremendous amount of structure within this particular disk. 
there were three features that really stuck out to us in the inner regions of the disk that I've marked with these red boxes, these original flows. And you can see that the arrows are all pointing towards together and flowing down, exactly as we saw in these uh, simulations of planet disk interactions. And what was particularly exciting about the locations of these three original flows is that they align exactly with the locations where planets are predicted to be. These two inner ones are exactly at the locations of gaps in the dust continuum. So we'd have a planet opening a gap in the dust and then material flowing down onto it. And this outer radius, although it was beyond the edge of the continuum, this was where Christoph Kunt found that lightning bolt in his data. And so we're seeing that exactly the same location, this collapsing flow of gas going down. And so this is really smoking gun evidence that not only do we must, must we have planets in these gaps to cause such a large perturbation in the velocity structure, but it's providing the first possibility that we can start to trace how rapidly material is transported from their chemically rich atmosphere down towards the mid -plane. This source also showed this intriguing extra part in the alpha disk where we see a disk wind. Now this particular source we've known has a, a very strong jet and indeed has a very strong disk wind, but these are on much larger scales than the disk. But with this sort of velocity structure that we're able to extract, you can see that in the outer edges of the disk, we have this very persistent radial flow away from the disk. And so we're starting to think that with these sort of techniques, we can start to trace disk winds and really understand how angular momentum is transported within these systems and can account for the accretion that we're seeing onto the central stars. So what was really, really reassuring about this particular observation is that when we went to model it, we really didn't need to do much tweaking at all. We were able to measure the temperature structure directly from the techniques that I showed you before. We knew exactly where in the disk the velocities were tracing. And from the gaps in the continuum and the localized velocity perturbation, we had a good idea of what the mass of the planet should be and at what radii. So we were able to mock up uh, the structure of the disk, put in three planets, evolve the disk and see what velocity structures we found. And that's what I'm showing you in this bottom panel. And almost straight away, we're able to find a really good match to the velocity structures that we're seeing in the disk. So this really shows how all these multiple methods are really allowing us to understand how the planets are interacting with their host disk. But this is really just the beginning for what we can do it, because there's no reason we need to use 12CO to do these sort of measurements. In fact, we can use whatever molecular emission is bright enough. And because we know different molecules are going to be tracing different heights in the disk, we can start to fill in this in the 3D sense. So these are some results, again, using the MAPS data, where I've been doing the same technique for MWC480, but using different CO isotope logs, so we can start to fill in this regime. And these sort of techniques are going to really allow us to map out the velocity structure in the full two dimensions. And that's going to not only allow us to search for planets more directly, but it's going to allow us to understand how efficiently material is transported from the atmospheres to the mid -planes, and it's going to allow us to search for dynamical instabilities. We can search for signs of things like the vertical shear instability or the disk wind. And this is really going to open up our understanding of how disks dynamically evolve. So I just want to wrap up. And to do that, I want to go back to the questions that I posed at the start. We don't really know yet what the mechanisms are that planets are forming through. And we don't know whether they're really accreting the same reservoirs and material. But I hope I've convinced you that with the techniques we've been developing over the last couple of years, we're going to be able to do that in the coming ones. Now that we have access to the ALMA data that we need and this series of analysis tools, we're really going to start to make significant progress on understanding what mechanisms we're using and what reservoirs and material these planets are accreting atmospheres from. This is going to really help us understand what a young solar system may have looked like and how that may have evolved into the system that we see today. So I really think with ALMA, with these techniques, and in particular by looking at the dynamical structure of the disks, we really are unraveling the planet formation process. We're now able to detect the population of the younger sets of planets, those that are still embedded in their parental disk, and are really going to allow us to test the mechanisms directly. We can map out the properties of their formation environment. We can look at the gas temperatures and densities and magnetic fields, and we can really understand what processes would be able to be uh, sustained in these sort of environments. 
And finally, we can really catalog the chemical complexity of this planet forming material. We can map its transport from the chemically rich atmosphere down towards where it's being accreted as an as a atmosphere. And so through these sort of studies, we're going to be able to make a direct connection with all those studies looking at the chore exoplanets and looking at those compositions to really understand where those planets may have formed. And so with that, I really want to thank you for your attention, and I'll be happy to take any questions that you may have. Thanks very much, Rich. Um, folks, if you have questions, just raise your hand or, or put it in the chat and um, I'll call on you. Um, I guess, let me get us started. Um, I actually wrote down a bunch of questions, even though I ask you questions every week. <laughs> I'm gonna go ahead and ask them. Um, so I'm sort of curious, you, you, didn't, you didn't push it, but um, what do you think are the prospects for actually seeing planets on solar system planet spatial distributions? Like could, could we, I mean, if you have kinematic deviations that are sort of 5% of Kepler velocity, something at you know, 40 AU will actually have a pretty, pretty large velocity deviation compared to the, the spectral resolution that you can get with an interferometer. Would that be easy or would that make things actually hard just because of spatial resolution? Um. I think it's, it's going to be very hard because you have this very awkward trade-off that although you're going inwards to um, smaller regions where the velocity deviations are larger in absolute units, the shift that they then create in terms of how that emission varies radially or azimuthally is actually much smaller because it's going to be the same sort of fraction. So you really need to couple these very high spectral resolution observations with very high spatial resolution observations. And while I think that there's a long way to go in terms of what we can do with ALMA, that's probably going to be a lot further down the line where we want to push below 100 milliard seconds and try and push to those 30 milliard second observations. Um, I do think, though, that there's going to be some hope in terms of the ELT um, for doing this. They, with Matisse, they expect to be able to spatially and spectrally resolve CO root vibrational lines. And I think there's a lot of potential there for doing the same sort of work, but on much, much smaller spatial scales uh, that will help us trace the terrestrial region. Yeah, that would be very cool. All right, any questions from the audience? Yes, um, I see someone's raising their hand, but I don't see who it is. Oh, John Raymond, go ahead. Uh, yeah, you had, a couple slides ago, you had those great uh, uh, plots of the velocities falling into the planet. What was the velocity scale of those arrows? Um, so those scales, they were on the order of about 10% of the sound speed. Um, so that was around 50 uh, meters per second at that location. Just trying to go back. Oh, so these ones here. Yeah, so I think these were on the order of 10, 20% of the local sound speed. Great. Uh, Erwin? You have to unmute yourself, Erwin. Or I can do it for you. Yes. Now, can you hear me? Yes. <laughs> Sorry, I always forget that. <laughs> I was wondering what dynamic range, dynamical range you get in detecting molecules in these protoplanetary disks and how much further you think you can go and how that compares, for example, with what we find on the Earth. Well, that's a good question. So I think really the limiting factor in what we're going to be able to detect in planet and disk, sorry, is that there's just not enough of them. The column densities of the molecules are too low. So I think we're approaching the regime of diminishing returns. I don't think we're gonna get much more than we've detected now because the integration times are just gonna skyrocket. But I think we're gonna to start to tease out some of these other ones with these new techniques that I was talking about, where we're probably gonna to get to the slightly larger simple organic species. But really going much more complex than that is gonna be very hard, I think. What is the current range that you've reached? Um, so at least in the submillimeter regime, I don't think we're getting much bigger than, uh, say, 
methyl cyanide or methanol. I think they're the biggest molecules that we've detected so far. Um, I can't speak to what's been done at shorter wavelengths. So I think when we move to something like James Webb, we're going to see a whole lot more. But um, I think there are other people in the audience that might be better suited to answer that. Uh, OK. Hey. Thanks, Erwin. Uh, Joe and Najita. Hi, um, Rich. Thank you for the wonderful talk with the gorgeous results that were just beautifully presented. Um, I guess I had a question that um, it seems like the amazing level of detail that you can extract uh, is partly due to the, I guess, low turbulence in, in the disks that you study. Do you expect that that's going to be the situation for most disks? And um, second question, are the dynamics that you're uncovering about the disks, do they tell us much about uh, how the planets form in terms of whether they actually create circumplanetary disks and whether they form hot or cold or warm? Um, so for the first question, I think the turbulence that we're seeing at the moment, everything points to them being very low levels of turbulence. And I don't think that's going to be um, too much of an issue because the even what we would consider high levels of turbulence for a protoplanetary disk is still going to be small compared to these systematic motions that we're seeing, say, due to these original flows. In terms of trying to actually understand the, the planet formation directly, that's going to be much harder because we need to trace closer to where the planets actually are in the midplane, and that means moving to these less abundant species like C18O. -no. And in order to get the same sort of observations that we are for 12 CO, you just need to integrate for an incredible amount of time. So that's going to be really tricky. I think it's going to be possible, and particularly by using the whole suite of molecular traces that we have, we're not only going to be able to understand the dynamical um, evolution of the disk, but we can start to look at the temperature and density, and sort of all those things together are, are really going to help understanding whether these planets are forming hot or cold. But ultimately, it's going to be a, a sensitivity issue and a spatial resolution issue. We're really going to need to put ALMA, push ALMA to its absolute limits to be able to do this. Um, but now that I think we've demonstrated that it's capable of doing that, then I'm positive that we're going to be able to get those sort of data sets in the near future. Thanks. Sounds really exciting. Thank you, Joan. Uh, Diana. So thank you for this really interesting talk. Um, I was wondering, so how much are you worried about things like the CO abundance and getting the magnitude of these velocities? I'm assuming it matters less than turbulence measurements, but. Yeah, so this is the really nice thing about dynamics is that we just don't care at all about that stuff. We just assume that the gas is being traced by the CO and we don't need to worry about at all what abundance it is. We make the assumption that it's optically thick and I think that is a relatively safe assumption for everything that we do with 12 CO. Most of the stuff that we do with 13 CO. With C18O, you know, it's going to be a bit trickier, um, but that's not really a problem that we have to face yet because we haven't had the observations. But at least everything that we're looking at now is really nice because we can circumvent those sort of um, issues with the analysis. Okay, we've come up to the hour. Does anyone have a very last question or, or no? I don't see any hands. Um, so I guess uh, let's just thank Rich again. <laughs> and uh, we'll see you all um, next week. Thanks very much. Thanks.